What's your name, dirtbag? When you think about expansion packs for games, at one point or another, you're gonna think of Half-Life Opposing Force. An expansion pack for Half-Life developed by none other than Gearbox Software and released way back in 1999. And man, what a year for gaming that was. We had Turok 2, System Shock 2, Quake 3 Arena and Unreal Tournament, among a bunch of others. It was just such an awesome time to be into shooters and the genre was being flooded with a lot of really good titles. A lot of which went on to become some of the most highly coveted for the whole industry. Now, expansion packs are a bit of a dead model these days, but back then, these were usually pretty high quality and did a good job of extending the life of a video game. Expanding upon the lore and the universe of whatever it was based off and adding its own spin to the formula. The way Valve has treated the Half-Life franchise lately has been like if someone gave birth to a kid, raised it up until it was a teenager, then dumped it at an orphanage, only to come back and then adopt them when they're in their 30s and completely jaded. Back when it all started though, there was a whole lot of love that went into this series. Posing Force is often regarded as one of the best expansion packs of all time, and it's definitely up there in regards to first person shooters. Half-Life at the time was one of the biggest things in gaming. I still remember that I had mates who weren't even into gaming that much who knew about Half-Life and wanted to come around to my house to play it. Like, it just had that kind of effect on people. So when an expansion pack was released, and one that lets you play as one of the very marines that form the enemy oppositions for the entire first game, well, it was something we all wanted to get our hands on. Looks like somebody really screwed up, Corporal. Gearbox would also eventually go on to develop the other expansion, Half-Life Blue Shift, where you played as Barney Calhoun, and even Half-Life Decay, which was the spin-off episode on the PlayStation 2 version. But their best work is with Opposing Force, and even playing it now, it's still as fun as it was all those years ago. In a lot of ways, I think I even prefer it to Half-Life because it does what Half-Life did, but it does it faster and more succinctly. You're in and you're out in a couple of hours. It's perfect. Oh, oh. I did a video on Half-Life a few years back, but I did kind of gloss over Opposing Force in the process. So I thought I'd go back and take another look at it, considering it's recently had its 20th anniversary. To start things off, Opposing Force has one of the single best training levels in maybe any game ever. Taking a few pages out of Full Metal Jacket, the training level starts off with you being yelled at by a drill sergeant when you're in boot camp. Corporal Shepard, huh? Looks more like Corporal Dog Meat to me! Before you bump to the top of the advanced training list and get put through the ringer to come up to speed with the new mechanics. You're playing as Corporal Adrian Shepard, and this guy ain't no pencil pusher. He's in the Marine Corps and graced with upper body strength and communication skills, allowing him to climb up ropes and interact with radios to contact other Marines. Apparently they've got other plans for Black Mesa now. This whole training sequence is just so entertaining. The writing is really funny, and you just go from section to section getting yelled at by different drill instructors. You call that a push-up? All the way down! It's a fun and memorable way of letting the player learn the controls instead of just having them pop up on the screen like we get in so many modern games. Holy shit, shit, you made it! What's that on your vest, soldier? Did that sting a little? Well, suck it up and drive on! It even works as world building too, like you see the G-Man at one point chatting to a superior officer, showing he's a lot more involved in things than it originally seems. In fact, throughout the campaign, the G-Man even saves your life on multiple occasions, even if he does also flush it down the toilet. Anyway, the setup is that it takes place around the time of the Resonance Cascade, and poor Shepard is sent into the Black Mesa facility, where we find out the guy's only 22 years old. Yeah, 22 years old, and he's being sent into a goddamn war zone to take on interdimensional aliens and deal with military corruption. I mean, when I was 22, all I wanted to do was get drunk and suck on some titties, and I did at least half of that. The opening sequence where you're flying into the facility in an Osprey is just awesome and there's some great banter between you and your marine buddies. Kinda reminds me of the banter between the colonial marines at the start of Aliens. In fact, I'm pretty sure that was a direct influence. Do you have a problem, Private? I will give you your orders when we have reached the LZ! You got that, soldier? Sir, yes sir! Anyway, you soon get attacked and it all goes foobar. These alien bastards shoot down your right and Shepard is knocked out. Once you wake up, you're then just trying to make your way to the evacuation chopper to get the hell out. But of course, things don't go to plan and you're stuck on the base, having to find alternate means to escape. Because Shepard's chopper went down before he got his orders, he and his buddies have no idea they're actually supposed to be killing the scientists and the other personnel. So you end up working with the Black Mesa staff a fair bit and having them help you out. 
In terms of the mechanics, Shepard is mostly the same as Gordon, just with a few key differences. For starters, instead of a HEV suit, Shepard has a PCV suit, which works exactly the same, even using the same batteries and wall outlets to recharge it. Instead of a flashlight, he's got the night vision goggles. Instead of a magnum, he's got a desert eagle. And instead of the crowbar, he's got a knife and a wrench. Seeing as you're playing as a marine now, it would be pretty silly if you got into fight with other marines, not to mention it really wouldn't make that much sense. So the new enemy types you're fighting are the Black Ops soldiers, which are supposed to have been sent in by the CIA. And this includes those female assassins from the original game. I always thought those assassins in Half-Life were just supposed to be some kind of elite marine or something, but apparently it turns out they're part of an entirely new faction, the more you know. I do find these guys a lot less intimidating than the Marines though, because instead of having these really creepy distorted voices, they all just talk normally. It somehow makes them a lot less threatening. They don't even communicate during combat either, but maybe this was done on purpose to make them seem more professional. Anyway, these guys aren't really all that different to fighting the Marines in Half-Life. They use the same tactics and they die from the same methods. This time, it's just a Desert Eagle to the face instead of a Magnum. Speaking of the Desert Eagle, this is a pretty cool new inclusion. This thing has two fire modes with or without the laser sight, which affects your accuracy and firing speed. You get better accuracy but a slower firing speed if the laser's on and vice versa if it's off. With the knife and the wrench, well, there's not much to say here. I mean, I think the wrench is better only because it breaks most crates and objects in a single hit, whereas the knife takes a bit more finessing. Shepard still uses the Glock, MP5, shotgun, RPG, and grenades, but he also gets a few new toys of his own due to his military training and accessing areas of the facility that old mate Gordon never got to explore. So due to his training, Shepard can use a sniper rifle, which is kind of like the crossbow, just without the projectile when firing. And it kills most enemies in a single hit, even the tougher new alien enemies, as long as it's a headshot. He also gets to use an M429 machine gun, and this is the shit right here. This thing holds 50 rounds before having to reload, and it does some serious damage. Along with some hefty recoil to the point that the weapon even knocks you backwards when firing full auto. This thing is the best gun in the entire expansion pack, and I never get sick of that sound effect. Instead of the Tau Cannon and the Gauss Gun, you've got the Displacement Cannon, which isn't really a weapon, but instead what it does is teleport an enemy to a completely different location. Kind of reminds me of the Banishment Device in Hexen. You just fire this thing at an enemy, and then they get teleported away entirely. The secondary fire mode for this though actually teleports Shepard to Zen, which I guess is supposed to be a last ditch effort if you're about to be killed. But there doesn't really seem to be any point to doing this. You're better off just reloading a quick save and cutting your losses. I think all of these new weapons are good inclusions though. The Desert Eagle and the Machine Gun are both really effective weapons and become workhorse for the entire campaign. Just means you won't be relying on the same old combo of the MP5, the Shotgun and the Magnum, which is a good thing. Opposing force could have gone the same old route as Half-Life, thrown you up against the same enemies and treaded the same path, but it does its best to mix things up a bit, but also still keep it all in line with the themes of the original game. You'll still be taking on familiar looking creatures from Zen, but the new lineup of enemies is a unique bunch of creatures known as Race X, who've used the Resonance Cascade as a reason to come to Earth and basically just act like a bunch of assholes. The most common ones are probably the Pit Drone and the Shock Trooper. One that shoots out spikes and the other one that shoots out electricity. The Shock Troopers are like tougher versions of the Alien Grunt, but easier to avoid because of how they fire their projectiles. <laughs> Finally, you've got the Voltagore, which is like a giant crab creature that launches out a purple energy blast that can kill you in a single hit. So yeah, that's fun. Coming into contact with Race X also gives Shepard access to some cool new guns as well. One of these is the Spore Launcher, which is like a little tadpole looking thing that fires out these little explosive clusters. This is a super effective weapon, but the reload time is really slow. Shepard will literally feed this thing little balls of fruit to reload it. He'll even give it a bit of a pat during the idle animation too, showing this weapon is actually a sentient creature, which is kind of cool. Oh, look at how cute it is. Another alien weapon is the Shock Roach, which is like an insecty thing used by the Shock Troopers. This thing again is pretty neat. It has an unlimited ammo supply. You just need to wait for it to recharge in between shots. Five shots from this thing will kill most of the Black Ops enemies on medium difficulty, causing them to also explode, which is lovely. 
It's not a bad weapon, but it's just not that effective when you've got a Desert Eagle and machine gun in your trousers. The last alien weapon is the Barnacle Grapple, which is a handheld version of the Barnacle Creatures that Gordon encountered so frequently in Black Mesa. And this, again, is another odd weapon. In fact, I struggle to even call it that but it's really only used a handful of times to get up to a higher vantage point, as it works like a grappling hook on organic surfaces. So outside of that, I just never found that much of a reason to use it. Being a corporal also means you get to push around to give orders to other soldiers you come across. Seeing as you're not fighting Marines this time, you're now fighting the Black Ops soldiers, you're gonna need all the help you can get. The two main friendly soldiers you need to worry about are the Medic and the Engineer. The Medic can heal your wounds, kind of like a portable first aid kit, and he's needed at key points to heal up other NPCs. Don't worry, soldier. I'll have you fixed up in no time. Then the other one is the Engineer, a soldier walking around with a propane tank on his back who can weld through locked doors. And again, like the Medic, you need this guy at key points to progress. Other than that, you've just got your standard grunt. Soldiers armed with shotguns and machine guns who are just happy to run around and kill things. And throughout the game, you'll frequently come across these guys and have them help you out during combat, which is always highly entertaining. Phew. Yeah, well, forget about Freeman. We've got to save our own asses. Yeah, and I love how they play up the stereotypes for each class too. The engineer is chomping down on a cigar and the medic is some weedy looking guy with thick frame glasses. Listen, we need to get our asses down to the extraction point near Lambda Sector. With any luck, we'll even get a shot at Freeman on our way out. It seems the time has been kind to the AI here as well. I remember their pathfinding was really bad when I first played the expansion pack, but now I'm shocked at how good they are at following me and keeping up, even helping out during combat. This might be due to the game receiving continuous updates over the years, even as recently as October 2019. But this is how it was always supposed to be, and it's still fun turning around and seeing these guys diligently following you. Somehow makes the game feel less lonely. It's just a shame they can't follow you on ladders or through vents, but while it lasts, these moments are definite highlights. Plus, it just does reinforce that whole concept of you being this enlisted soldier. I mean, in Half-Life, Gordon was really just on his own, trying to escape the facility and only coming across the surviving members of the science team sporadically. In Opposing Force, though, you're a small cog in a big wheel. So it makes more sense to encounter soldiers more often. You're probably one of hundreds of guys sent in to clean things up. I'm not letting you go until you talk. Overall, Opposing Force really feels like a more compact version of Half-Life's campaign. There's some areas set on Zen, but they come up a lot earlier and they're far shorter. Thank God. It even has its own version of Blast Pit, this time called Pitworm. With a similarly large-sized creature, you have to vacate from its location by turning on a series of machines to get rid of it. Like some kind of oversized post-grog bog that just won't flush. It follows along similar rhythms too. The game starts with the incident that kicks off the entire plot. Then there's the part where you're only armed with melee weapons before the last third or so of the game involving pretty much nothing but combat before the final boss. It's just instead of going through a portal to fight this thing, it comes through a portal to fight you. When I first played Opposing Force as a kid, I think it probably took me maybe five or six hours to finish. Nowadays I can get through it in pretty much a single sitting. It takes me 90 minutes to two hours tops but it all just feels like a really tightly crafted experience. There's never a dull moment and the whole thing is just perpetually propelling you forward. Those massive speed humps you got in Half-Life with chapters like Blast Pit and On a Rail are completely gone in opposing force. From that moment you get that wrench and start whacking headcrabs, up until you're sending the final boss back to his home world, the action really never lets up. Like the other Half-Life games too, I don't really recommend playing this on hard mode. The difference between medium and hard is just the amount of health points that enemies have. And with some enemy types, it almost doubles their health points as well as the damage they dish out. It's not a game that's notorious for its highly skill-based shooting. It's more about the pacing of the campaign and the flow of the environment. So playing it on medium really makes it feel like an enjoyable and challenging experience. This is why I think it's such a perfect expansion, because it just takes all of the good stuff from Half-Life, adds in its own content, and runs with it. There's even some really cool moments too, when you see certain sequences from Half-Life played out from Shepard's perspective. Like that guy giving the radio transmission that Gordon comes across in surface tension. Repeat, we are pulling out and commencing airstrikes. Repeat, we are pulling out and commencing airstrikes. Or even seeing Gordon himself as he runs into the portal that sends him to Zen. Blue Shift would eventually try to do the same thing that Opposing Force did, only they did it from the perspective of a Black Mesa security guard and it wasn't quite the same. Also, 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 fuck.
Also, this thing was really short. I mean, I reckon it could be finished in two or so hours, even for a first time playthrough. I remember Half-Life Decay on the PlayStation 2 was really short too, so maybe they just ran out of ideas after opposing force. One thing that always kind of pissed me off about this series, among a lot of other things, was that they never ever said what actually happened to Shepard. Now look, I won't spoil what happens in the ending, but this guy's ultimate fate was never really stated, and we've been wondering for years what happened to him. For a lot of people, myself included, he's a bit of a fan favourite. In the notoriously fucking awful Half-Life fan game, Hunt Down the Freeman, it turned out that protagonist Japlangas was actually Adrian's brother. And they even planned to do a sequel where you had to track down your brother's whereabouts. Of course, we all know how Hunt Down the Freeman turned out. Yeah, it was a piece of shit. You fucked up my face. So, as it stands, Opposing Force is really all we're ever going to probably get for this guy. Unless they ever make some kind of spin-off, which is highly doubtful. Opposing Force is a really good example of that expansion pack model that's since become defunct. It's an example of a really early product made by Gearbox Software, and it's an example of when the Half-Life series was really at its peak. The best thing about all of these old Half-Life games too is that they still run flawlessly on modern computers at widescreen resolutions. And for a game from the late 90s, that kind of thing really is a godsend. When there's a Steam sale, you can pick this expansion pack up for a couple of bucks. And along with Half-Life and Blue Shift, there's really no reason to not have played either of these at this point. You fucked up my face.